Jeff, you mentioned the split-second decision. I know the report details one supervisor who took the time to change uniform, get in the car, and go join the chase. And in that case, it doesn't sound like his life was put on the line making that split-second decision to jump in when there was clearly already, at that point, a number of cars involved and officers. I don't know about the uniform. I don't know about the supervisor, do you? As, as far as the, the sergeant, he was aware of it, that, and yeah, the sergeant was aware of it, and uh, what, when he became aware of it, he was in fact putting on his gear and stuff, but he's monitoring the radio at that time and in control of it. And uh, as far as that sergeant controlling it, I, I think he did a fine job through the whole thing. The next day after uh, radio tapes were released and everything else, I heard plenty of compliments on how Seaford handled himself over the radio and how everything was handled. That boss several times stepped in and then asked for aviation uh, strips. And you got to remember too, that officer involved is also asking, this is serious here, we got a shooter, active shooter, mobile shooter, please keep the airwaves clear. Um, and as far as any other bosses uh, that are, are, are alleged to be inactive during that, uh, there's a mentality out there with the sergeants. A, a sergeant has control of that. The other sergeants aren't going to jump in and take control of that unless they, they see something that is of danger. Now, through that whole chase, there was never no, he almost struck a pedestrian. He did hit a pedestrian in the crosswalk. And my hat's off to the patrolmen that blocked those intersections. They did a fine job. And that's where a lot of the cars come into play afterwards. After that intersection's blocked and everything's gone by, they simply hop in and lag behind. If you see most of those footage with the 50 cars going by, that's more like an O.J. Simpson chase where it's pretty slow. There's no high speeds there of 100 miles per hour or anything such as that. Now, when all these officers, what they know in their mind is happening right then and there, which is there is an active shooter that just took a shot at a policeman, that's what they're thinking, that's what's perceived to be believed at that time, they're not going to let their fellow brothers down. That just is not going to happen. They're going to be there for them. These things, most of these chases end in bailouts, and, and now you've got possibly two suspects with guns running around, and, and I think it would be a dereliction of duty for them to hold off and not be involved to apprehend these uh, uh, arm, perceived armed suspects for danger not only to the officers involved, but also the uh, civilians out there. Any other supervisory questions I could answer? Jeff, could you talk a little bit about, um, you make some You should wait till all the facts come in. It's simple. Just take a step back, wait till all the facts come in, you know, show a little support to the officers or show a lot of support to the officers and get it out to the public right. I don't think we're here, if he, if he, if he doesn't give that statement, I don't think we're here like this today. Well, maybe we are now, but we're not here, you know, over the last few weeks. You, know, you gotta learn to take a step back and get the facts. You don't get the facts in five, six, seven, eight hours when none of our officers have given a statement to anybody. You don't know what they were going through. That was pure hell for them. It, the emotions ran, you know, and hopefully you guys get the BCI's tape someday. You know, you watch and how, what the emotions are in these guys. These are seasoned veterans that do their job, they come to the job, they, come, they go home, they go to their families. They're not coming to do what they had to do that night, but they're sworn to do it, and they did their job that day. Well, it's kind of funny, uh, I, the, the sticks, I uh, went to the, uh, or strips, I went to the uh, second district the other day, and that's where it was initiated from. I found them, I found them both. Uh, one was upstairs, one was in the car, but they're both broken right now. And they're both broken and they're not uh, functioning, and the company that uh, services them has gone out of business about two, three years ago. So it's, it's it was... You know, we're not up to date on equipment. And why only have two? Why only have 13 in the city? I mean, we, we, we give money back every year in the contracts to say, let's buy more equipment. And the mayor says they give, 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 give. Well, keep giving. Let's get up to the 2000s, not the 90s. Right. Um, as far as the uh, support after, uh, should I go into the chapel? The support after, there wasn't much support. The, uh, uh, the chief had a chaplain come down, um, and he's assigned. We used to have uh, Dr. Tenerovich, and she was there forever. She, uh, her nickname was Red. Uh, she was a great lady for everybody to go talk to. Um, it was always in confidence, um, and she was just a great person. 
right now we don't have anybody and we haven't had anybody for a while and we have a chaplain that uh, sometimes likes to be a detective and ask questions you know on what's going on with the event and instead of knowing how you're doing and what can I do for you that's how the beginning of this went after the fact I think he saw that uh, you know he needed to give these guys a little bit more support but to this day and I don't know who's out there but uh, I don't think the chief has contacted any of our officers yet I mean there's enough contacting the public and the Justice Department but what about our officers I'm not sure I'm 100% correct, but I think it goes right back into the general fund. I think we put money back into the general fund when we have, a, uh, when we have money left over. Jeff, you talked about uh, the rush of judgment by this panel uh, made up by the chief, chief of police. Specifically, what has been said to the officers that were involved in this, and who, who is saying it to them? Uh, you know what? It's, it's officers tell me what other people are saying, so I really not get in who's saying what out of the panel. But members of the panel have told these guys they're getting suspended, uh, demoted. Um, people might lose their jobs over this. I mean, it was very one-sided. And I'm hearing this two, three, four weeks ago before any tapes or any interviews are completed by us. Jeff, we, we've all had a chance to look at some of the information that came out because there's a lot from uh, BCI. Is there anything in there that you uh, wish didn't happen or that there were any mistakes made between just between the time we heard what sounded like gunshots and the time we entered the parking lot, because that sort of comes a different situation when we're dealing with cops on the scene and a car coming out. I understand. I mean, you know, why, why, why is it, why is it turn on, why is it, all right, but why is it turn Right. Is, is accurate in terms of its portrayal. But how do you turn that on, on us to be the bad guys? We weren't the bad guys. We were the police. I know. I think the suggestion that there you know, was systematic failure and a lot of emotion that got in the way of making accurate descriptions of what was happening. I'm just asking, do you think there was anything in those two points prior to the gun or the car coming out officers uh, that should have been different, could have been different? No, because you have, if you go through the whole incident, you got the, the shots fired down downtown. You have them pointing a gun. You have, uh, I think at that point, almost a um, trying to ram a police car, uh, reloading a weapon, uh, speeds from 60 to 100, um, to the deadly force into the parking lot where the one suspect is looking like she has a gun. The vehicle comes back at that officer where he's in fear for his life. The vehicle doesn't stop there after maybe a couple of shots. Maybe a couple of shots should have stopped him and warned him even way back when, before all this, it should have stopped. And then the vehicle still goes after other officers. So I, you know, these officers did the job they had to do that day because of the circumstances that were put on them. And it's all by the uh, suspect's actions. Jeff, the uh, Attorney General said the system failed you guys. Based on what you're saying here today, do you still, do you believe that the system failed you? I'm, I'm hearing defense of the, the different points that the Attorney General made where it failed you, but it seems like you know you defend it, so you, you're failing to what he said in regards to that. The system failed us. You know the officers went out there with the equipment we have, and they did the job best the way they could with the stuff they had that time. The system, meaning equipment, stuff like that, maybe. Training. It's got to be instinctual. Well, our yeah, training is a whole different thing. I mean, we have more classroom training training than physical uh, driving and stuff like that. Our training can always be better. Get us out of the classroom, get us into these kind of situations uh, as far as chases and stuff like that. Get us out of the classroom. There's some things for the classroom, but our job is all in the field. It's all hands on. We're going to the bad guys and we're going to help the good people out there. You know, and then we get resistance on people that are um, defined to us. Are you hearing other departments train that way and we don't? Or? Um, I don't know. You know one thing is, I mean, we, the pit maneuvers, you know, why don't, we, why, don't we, why don't we have those now? You know, why don't we train for that? That might have stopped this chase way in the beginning. And that's used statewide. We have to get up with the 2000s on our training, you know, as far as what's out there, as far as equipment for us to use for our safety. Do the job to protect and serve. 
You know what? <laughs> That's half right. Um, we're still going out there doing our jobs. There are five districts. There's two shifts going out there. These guys love their job. They're going out there. They're answering runs. They're coming to help the citizens out there. No matter what people think of us, we're still going out there doing our jobs. Um, he should be concerned because the morale is an all-time low right now. And officers are, officers are second-guessing what they're doing out there because they're afraid of the administration. Jeff, uh, the Attorney General also said that supervisors should have played a better role in, paying, uh, in maintaining control of the chase. Do you agree with that? Well, yeah, I, I'll let Brian answer, but I, what all those supervisors that were in that chase, I know personally, they were good officers before, they're good officers now, they participated in that chase, and they were faced with the same circumstances that we were, and I support every one of them also. Yeah, and if you've had the opportunity to listen to any of the tapes, all five channels, specifically channel two, which was the most uh, airtime for it, 22 minutes involved in that chase, uh, I don't think there's a supervisor out there that says that, uh, um, the sergeant that was in control of that chase did anything wrong, even days later, even to up to this t point right now. Uh, all our supervisors support what that sergeant did entirely. And uh, if you listen to it, even just a common citizen listened to it, you didn't hear anything out of control as far as uh, a pedestrian struck or anything wild and out of control that showed intimate danger to where somebody better step in and stop this thing. And then you also have to weigh the balance of how the seriousness of this. It's, it's, the extreme circumstance here, an officer being uh, perceived to be shot at. But the Attorney General also said that the supervisor was not aware of how many cars were involved in the case. And that would be a correct statement by that uh, supervisor, and mainly because he's in his, uh, in his car trying to catch up to where they are here and where it's at and everything else. He doesn't have the capability to log and see AVLs and see how many cars might have jumped in or what have you. And, and his cars, you know, that would only be for his cars as well. If there's other districts, he's not going to be able to see that as well. Um, uh, so he was only in control of what he could hear going on. Like I said, he didn't hear any recklessness or anything else. Everything seemed fairly controlled. Good commands were being relayed to him and everything else. And then several of the bosses that were uh, on the scene and might have seen uh, the, the, the uh, chase going past them and everything, uh, I can't relay who they are or too much of their statements, but a lot of it's coming back that they, they, seemed, they heard what he was ordering over the air and, and how he was monitoring and while they're monitoring and they seen parts of the chase, they didn't see anything out of the ordinary danger-wise to put a stop to that or to notify him that, hey, something's wrong here, are you aware of that? And uh, back to, uh, you know, DeWine, uh, I gotta say this, you know, he released a statement, one, it's kind of odd, Never before have I seen an investigative unit hold a news conference and release facts before he's going to convey it to the prosecutor to render a decision. Now, I know that him and McGinty were uh, in cahoots with that and in agreement with it, and part of it's because this has been so sensationalized, okay? The public wants to know quick, the media wants to know. In this day of Facebook and Twitter and social media, it's, uh, we're getting beyond some of the facts here of the importance of let's get everything out there. He opened up a statement by saying that the BCI is tasked with uh, gathering the facts and not rendering any opinions or recommendations, when in fact the last part of his statements was entirely throwing the city of Cleveland, the division of police, and everybody under the bus with his uh, opinions and, and, and recommendations, to be honest with you. And the impact on the overall investigation, in your opinion, by his statement? Well, I, it, it could be damaging to both Jeff and I as we go forward representing our officers in discipline. Uh, uh, coming up, uh, to be honest with you. And to be honest with you, you know, these uh, 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 family members of the two deceased, we already know they're probably going to come after the suit, city and sue. I, mean, I wouldn't doubt it if they got an attorney the very next day. But I think that some of his words add to damaging the, the city's uh, legalities as well. Brian, what, we've got a lot of information from DeWine. What are some of the facts that uh, you seem to suggest that we haven't heard yet or hasn't all come out? What is, we've seen all the statements, we've read them, uh, we are looking at the tapes, because mm -hmm. I do think it, it gives you, conveys the emotional impact of what the folks were going through. Right. But what are we missing? I don't know that you're missing too much. Uh, you know, there's going to be another part of this. We've been through stages of when uh, there's been news conferences and, and releases, and a lot of them, quite frankly, like by the city, they've held several news conferences simply to tell you that it's ongoing. And it's almost like a knee-jerk reaction to a news conference that some of those family members might have given the day before. So there's a lot of knee-jerk reaction on their part to just let the eminent know that 
we're still going forward and, and, and going to uh, investigate this. Uh, there's no doubt in my mind as we go into this, as far as you know, policies and procedures are concerned, obviously when my members give their statements and everything, they're going to be held to explain some of their actions and or inactions, okay? And once they get that opportunity, the chief or whoever the hearing officer is or this panel when they interview them, they're going to determine are those excuses good enough? Because, you know, you have GPOs, they are general police orders. But a lot of times, some of them are, are, for instance, guidelines on how to go forward and handle something. Certain times, things get totally out of control and the unexpected occurs. And that's why you see constant changes in policies sometimes every couple of years to update that because you have a sensational event like this. I ask you, when was the last time that we had a situation like this? I had, as asked Ed Gallick this yesterday, I go, when can you tell me that we had a police chase and a shooting like this and that we could compare this to and how it's happened? This is almost like a perfect storm, once in a lifetime thing that happened. And now Jeff and I are tasked with representing our members the right way and going forward. And in doing so, we support both the supervisors and the patrolmen in their actions during this event. You know, and one thing that comes up is the two-car thing is the big issue with the media asking uh, the likes of Jeff and I and everybody else involved in this. And as far as that two-car rule, I mean, you got that line that says, unless unusual circumstances and you could articulate the correct way or whatever. Um, that being said, this is the most unusual circumstance we had with a, a, an active shooter perceived to shoot at two policemen outside. It don't get no more ordinary than, uh, unordinary than that. Um, as far as that goes, uh, you know, policies, that's why they do change. They might have to correct that language. Another thing, there's a lot of Monday morning quarterback coming after us the day after and, and continues on. When a, when a patrolman takes a sergeant test, a sergeant takes a lieutenant test, you take this exam, you got 200 questions you're going to answer or so. You got multiple choice, A, B, C, and D. If there was a policy on this thing with the two cars and the pursuit, and that was one of your main questions, you got a couple minutes here to scratch your head, wonder, hmm, process of elimination, I think it's C, and take your time doing so. These guys had split-second decisions to be made, including the boss, on allowing it or not allowing it to, uh, to go. So judging somebody the day after and so forth, and then months later during uh, disciplinary hearings and everything else, they're not taking that into account, and that's mine and Jeff's job to bring that up to them and hope that they understand that, and that's all we could hope for. I've been through plenty of discipline uh, uh, hearings uh, the last seven years now. There's a lot of times where we go and we felt that our member was explained of his actions wholeheartedly. We come out of there, uh, two days later we find out he's getting a three-day suspension and we just can't even believe it. But that's, that's the nature that we live in. Split-second decision always the right one? What's that? I would hope so. In this case, I think that it was. I think everybody acted properly here. Jeff or Brian, um, given the highly sensational and public nature of this case, as you call it, um, how would you like to see McGrath act um, in regards to abusing the public hungry for information and the city administration and you guys? What's, what's the best thing he could have done? Well, I missed the beginning, but I mean, with the I, BCI cleared, I believe, that scene about 12, 1 or 2 between 12 and 2 o'clock the next day. The press release was uh, by he, the, what he made was from around 7, 8 o'clock. He hasn't talked to anybody. He doesn't know what the people that use the Delhi Force in. It could have been something more, hey, I'm still gathering facts. I'll let you know when we get an update. Um, and also, yeah, and support them. I, I, and, and I'll uh, pivot off of Jeff's uh, take there. Um, you know, I would expect you know, I, I, I've heard a lot of complaints from my membership as well uh, regarding, you know, uh, the feeling of the administration throwing them under the bus, bus and so forth. I would expect the administration to come forward and say, hey, we had a terrible incident that happened the previous night. It's under investigation. Uh, there are things that we can and can release at this time, but we do stand behind our officers until we learn otherwise and go forward with it and back your officers. That's the main thing.
know, just a real quick, I mean, in this pursuit, there, we also have an active uh, shooter policy also. I mean, I find that this, you know, a, a police officer being shot at downtown, there is an active shooter, and that thought was running among a lot of, a lot of officers. So you have the active shooter, you have the pursuit policy, and like I said, we have not had this situation in ages going towards this vehicle through a 20, 25 mile chase, through the officers hearing the radio dispatch, through the uh, pointing a gun at the officer, officers, what they perceive to be a gun. Now this is what we had throughout the whole chase. And then it was never, they never stopped. And that word has been big. They should have stopped, it should have been over with, but it went to the parking lot. It didn't stop when he went uh, uh, after Patrolman Diaz didn't stop there. He went all the way over and tried to get out, ramming another police car at between 15 and 25 miles in a, a, a school parking lot. That's pretty fast in a parking lot. Do you have any responsibility, you think, with the public safety director and Marty Flass and acknowledge this or not? I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. I'm just Do you think there's any responsibility to be held with Marty Flass, the public safety director of the city, or not? I'm concentrating on the chief right now. Let's start, let's start one thing at a time here. That'll be uh, long down the line, Scott, as far as disciplinary hearing. Like I said, this is going in waves here. You're going to be back here with me and Jeff probably in May, June, July, August, whenever the administrative part's done. And there's no doubt in my mind that we're going to be attending some disciplinary hearings out of this. I'm, I'm sure of it. This just isn't going to go away. I know. So down the road then, we'll see what kind of punishment is administered. And we'll be quite vocal if we see any terminations, any demotions over this or anything. I could tell you right now, what we know, sitting through all these interviews so far, there should be no demotions or terminations in this case at all. Or suspensions or reprimands. These guys made sure throughout that whole chase that everybody was safe, everybody went home, civilians, and I think people miss that, that a car that's going between 50 and 100 miles per hour throughout the whole city, nobody else got hurt. That commends our officers and how they blocked the intersections and let everybody else get through. If that car or one of our police officers would have hit another vehicle and, God forbid, kill somebody else that was innocent in that, you know, we're, we're here on a wholly, totally different thing. It didn't happen because they're trained professionals and they know how to do their job. What if some of the officers in the lot had been killed, though? Because of the what because if? 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 I can't go with the what if on that. You know. To be honest with you, just the act of them trying to is just as bad as if one of our officers would have been killed, period. And we're lucky that day there was nobody. There was so much crossfire, we're lucky that nobody else did get hit. I mean, there's probably there's another 90 uh, bullets out there that didn't, aren't accounted for. Yeah. You know, and, and you also got to ask me, what if we would have stopped pursuing? You know, when we stop pursuing, the bad guys don't stop. They think they're still being pursued. They keep going. And there's been, there's been instances where we'll stop pursuing two, three, four miles. They're cracking up in their car and killing somebody else like that. I mean, it's our job to bring them to justice. <coughs> Anything else? If anybody needs my business card from the media so you got the correct spelling and everything, just see me up here. All right, thank you, everybody. We support these officers. We love them.